Welcome to Straight Talk Africa. After 29 years at the Voice of America and 20 years at the helm of this show, Shaka Sali is retiring. In this show, we will hear from colleagues, fans from different parts of the continent, and of course, from the Kabbali kid himself. Peter Clote, who has worked closely with Shaka, is here to chat with him about his life and work. Uh, thank you, Vincent. Shaka Sali conceptualized Straight Talk Africa and remained the show's managing editor and host since its inception more than two decades ago. It's an honor to chat with Indugu Shaka, affectionately called the Kabali Kid. Hello, Shaka, and how are you? Hello, Ndugu Peter. I have to say that I'm hugely, hugely terrific, especially because I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to be hosted by you and to interact with you perhaps for the first time during my period here at the Great Voice of America. Thank you, Dugu. So let's begin the conversation. What was the major motivating factor that made you make the decision to become a journalist? Well, to be honest with you, it is a series of events. Because when I grew up as a young kid, I remember my father had a radio by the name Pi. And he used to listen to that radio every day. And I, w I used to join him on the fireplace in the living room to listen to those voices. And one thing led to another. In primary school, I used to interact with cinema, movies, to the extent that initially, Peter, I have to confess that I wasn't really thinking about journalism, but rather I was thinking about becoming a cowboy. Mm. I admired a guy called John Wayne, Gene Autry, and Clint Eastwood at that time. So I actually wanted initially to become a cowboy, not anything else. But I couldn't make it. <laughs> so, so while having this affection for the cinema, what motivated you to get into the military? Well, it is very interesting because, first of all, as I watched cinema, sometimes I would look at uh, soldiers in a military uniform, and they were incredibly smart. They had unfettered access to the officers to a pistol, and I sort of liked the pistol. I liked to play with it. Mm -hmm. And I liked the discipline. I liked the parade, especially because when I was in the primary and the junior secondary, I used to, to, I used to be a member of the school's boys' brigade. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in the boys' brigade, you're pretty much like um, a young lad doing the same things that soldiers do. And so that is, I think, eventually how I ended up in the military, not knowing, by the way, that uh, the military as an institution was an incredibly conservative and one might say reactionary type of institution which required a lot of discipline mm -hmm. to the extent that uh, you are never, never allowed, for example, to be anywhere near what Socrates would be doing, as I later discovered in universities. You are never expected to say why if you are given orders. That is how I end up in the military. And it was good for me, really, when or why it lasted, until there was a military coup. And then I started seeing firsthand how people with power can actually abuse power and the consequences 
of those types of actions. That's probably when I started thinking about becoming a journalist. Mm. So how did you transition from the military following the coup d'etat to want to come to America, study in America to better or improve yourself? I had done my homework. When I was an officer cadet, I was being trained by the Israelis. And some of my trainers had actually gone to school in California. Mm. And we used to talk about some of these things because at that time, uh, I, had, I had been reading very widely. I used to read, for example, the daily newspaper, the Uganda Agus, which would obviously woke me throughout the country. I would read Drum Magazine, which was published out of South Africa. In fact, Soweto, mm. which was the southwestern township of Johannesburg, hence Soweto. Mm -hmm. And through Drum Magazine, I basically walked across the African continent and to some less extent, the diaspora. And then I started, in fact, later reading American magazines. Whenever I would go to the library downtown Kampala, I would read Ebony magazine. Mm. I would read Newsweek, Time magazine. I would read the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times. You name it. And later, I would read and fall in love with the Reader's Digest. Mm -hmm. You know, those types of things. And of course, at the same time, I was watching people working in broadcasting. Right. And it felt like this would probably be the best opportunity for me to become an advocate of what I consider to be social justice for all of us, especially having seen, observed, and experienced the abuse of power when I was a paratroop lieutenant in the army. Mm -hmm. Now, Shaka, when we told your fans that this was your last show, they sent us a lot of questions. So I'm going to start with a question from a fan from Ghana. Mm -hmm. Hello, Shaka, good morning. This is Prosper um, from Ghana. Shaka, I just want to find out, um, growing up as a child in your elementary school days, what was your motivation that brought you up to this far? And um, I just want to add that, what is the secret behind your, your, your much wisdom? Thank you very much. Your reaction, Inugu. Thank you very much, uh, Prosper. Um, as an elementary student, I immediately developed an interest in reading the daily English newspaper, the Uganda Agus. And it was through the Uganda Agus that I had the opportunity, of course, to strengthen or build my vocabulary. And in primary six, I remember, we would be given an assignment to write compositions. And because of reading the Uganda Agus, I had, I had benefited enormously on that experience enriching my vocabulary. And so what I would do, as a matter of fact, is I would lift some adjectives out of the Uganda Agus and insert them in my English composition. Right. The teacher, David Kanavahita, who I understand now is Canon Kanavahita, would look at my essay or composition and would not understand how I could come across some of these seemingly inaccessible adjectives. Mm -hmm. But that's really how the world started opening for me. Right. Let's go to another question uh, by a fan from all places, Uganda. 
Hello VOA, this is Saim Siwa Brian, a student LLB uh, Law at Bishop Stewart University in Africa, Uganda. So my question to Shaka, what's that thing that inspired him to become a journalist and actually become a TV presenter? That's all. We celebrate your life, Mr. Shaka. Bless you, the Lord. Thank you very much, my brother from Uganda. What really Ndugupita inspired me to become a journalist was largely when I was in the military service. And as I told you a little bit earlier, I started seeing how some of my colleagues were abusing power. And because of that, I realized that I really had to do something. So when I left the army later, the first thing that came to mind really for me was to get an opportunity to learn and become a journalist so that I could use it really not only as a tool for making people informed, but as a weapon for addressing the issues of social, economic, cultural, political justice for all of us. That's really how I started. Well, Ndugu, uh, let's have another personal question from one of your fans in once again, Ghana. Hello, my name is Adnan Mustafa and I am from Ghana. My question is, I'd like to know what has been the motivation behind such an industrious career. Back to you, Shaka. Adnan Mustafa from Ghana. It is because of people like, uh, the influence of people like the Osage for really, uh, that I felt like I needed to be a sort of disciple in his efforts to rebellate the people of Africa. You know, there was somebody, and I think it was the South African former president, Nelson Mandela, the Madiba, who actually said that what counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived, but rather how you are able to reach out and touch someone else, to make a difference in someone else's life, rather than to simply be contented, for example, in having the opportunity to eat in Yamachoma, if you are coming from East Africa, mm -hmm. or if you are eating pepper soup, if you are coming from West Africa, Nigeria, and what have you, or fufu for that matter, mm -hmm. or couscous if you are coming from North Africa, shima if you are coming from Southern Africa, but rather if you can in fact make a difference in other people's lives. That that is in fact what determines the type of life that you lead. The great Madiba indeed. Well, in Shaka, I want our viewers to see how it was to travel with the Kabale kid on the continent. Your producer and longtime friend Paul Indihu takes us on a journey. Shaka has had a profound impact on me. As a young person, I grew up listening to the Voice of America. He came to speak to students of mass communication and journalism at Makere University in Uganda in November 1997. I went and attended that lecture that he was giving. He challenged us as young students. He's like, you know what? You guys don't just settle for what you learn in school here. If you want to be great, you can even be greater than me. Some of you guys can climb on my shoulders and see a little bit far. Uh, if you happen to be in Washington, D.C., call me. When he uh, talked to us about uh, becoming reporters, I was inspired. 
And I think that was the first time I actually ever met Shaka because I had big plans. I wanted to leave that country like yesterday. He was one of the first people I called. Once I got a visa, I said, hey Shaka, you know what? I'm on my way to America. One of the interesting things about Shaka is that uh, he is an amazing force of nature. His ability to inspire a lot of uh, people on the continent, especially young people, and I've also seen him interact with some African leaders, is remarkable. But uh, perhaps uh, more importantly, he exudes a humility. I've never interacted with somebody in my line of work or been around somebody who is so simple, almost to a fault. That's Shaka Sali. One of uh, the most memorable uh, incidents uh, for me was uh, when we arrived in Tanzania in, in the middle of the night and uh, my passport had run out of pages and so these immigration officers uh, did not want to give me an entry visa. They literally wanted to deport me. These guys were looking at Shaka. They are all like giggling and like smiling. They want to take selfies with him. So Shaka is like, okay, hello, what seems to be the problem, gentlemen? And uh, these immigration officers were like, uh, you know, uh, your colleague here doesn't have uh, a page where we can put a visa for him to enter Tanzania. So Shaka asked them, he's like, you guys, you want to take selfies with me, but you don't want to let my producer in. The immigration officer in charge at the time said, you know what, young man? I'll do this just because you're with Shaka. Bring your passport. Which visa do you want us to cover? I said, pick a page. They picked a page, they gave me a visa, and we entered Tanzania. There were different occasions. Uh, I don't even know how people would figure out uh, where we were staying. Uh, for example, uh, there is not a single hotel that we stayed in uh, where people did not storm the hotel looking for Shaka. Uh, people would not leave until they sat down with Shaka or had a drink with Shaka. We went to Congo on assignment. It was also interesting how President Kabila and uh, his people welcomed Shaka. President Kabila said, you know what, I know you guys are here for an interview, but uh, what would you want to do first before uh, we sit down for an interview? Shaka said, can we go to uh, Ingadam? Uh, then President Kabila was like, of course. Uh, he made a few calls. They literally had a guard of honor, uh, all these dignitaries waiting to greet us once we landed at, at Inga. And of course, the entire time that we were in Congo, we had an armored convoy. One of the most uh, memorable moments for me was uh, when we paid a courtesy call on uh, the former president of Zambia, Dr. David Kenneth Kaunda. When we walked in, uh, President Kaunda said, Hello, young man. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Shaka Sali. I admire you. I admire your work. Then Shaka was like, Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you are one of my role models. Because of his age, he tries to you know, not to interact a lot with a lot of people. But when he saw Shaka Sali, he said anything for you. He even gave us a tour of his residence, uh, played piano for us. It was uh, remarkable. I don't want him to retire. I want him to figure out how to use his voice his influence, his connections. A lot of young people admire him and I think he could uh, take advantage of that and uh, continue to do this kind of stuff where he gives motivational speeches, uh, continues uh, to uh, give public uh, lectures at uh, some of uh, these uh, greater universities that we have in Africa. Uh, thank you for inspiring me and thank you for inspiring so many others uh, who came uh, before me. Thank you very much, uh, Paul Indiho. Well, Shaka, you got a lot of attention traveling on the continent, but you have also inspired a lot of young people to be journalists. Here is a fan who mimics you. Watching live from uh, the Voice of America, but due to COVID-19, we now do it live in my house, located in a city suburb of Washington, D.C. Welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I take this opportunity to congratulate you, 
Shaka, upon this, twenty years of hosting the Straight Talk Africa. So as time is not our best ally, stay better and not better, my friend. Well, Indugu, briefly, what is your reaction hearing from Indugu Paul and somebody who mimics you right down from Uganda? I have to say, frankly, that uh, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled for their compliments and support. And I say this from the deepest, better part of the bottom of my Kavali heart and soul. And when I talk about Sam, I had the opportunity to actually talk to him yesterday via telephone link up. Mm. He was in my hometown, Kavali, oh, wow. southwestern Uganda. <laughs> And I was very delighted to learn that he is no longer simply a senior six graduate. He has actually enrolled in Burnham University reading for a, a Bachelor of Arts degree in journalism. Wow. And I told him to go for it. And I told him let him try to make sure that he becomes the best that he could be. Mm. And I also added that anything he thinks that uh, anything that he thinks I could do to help him complete his studies, I am more than willing to do so. Mm. So I am really both flattered and humbled for a young individual like Sam to watch me for the last so many years and want and wish not only to stand on my shoulders and see a little bit further, but also try to become like me. Well, as Shaka calls time on his illustrious career here at VOA, our colleagues share their experiences in their respective interactions with the Kabali kid. In one word, I would describe Shaka as unassuming. Intelligent. He's a humble guy. Awesome. You know, it's hard to describe Shaka in one word, but if I had to, I would go with trailblazer. Shaka's empathy is one attribute I will never forget. I lost my mom five months after joining BOA. Her death was sudden and heart-wrenching. My mother and I are very close. And at the time, I didn't know Shaka very well. But moments after an email was sent out about my loss, Shaka came over to my office with a check of $100 and told me he knows I may have to travel for my mom's funeral to have some sort of closure and asked me to stop by his office if I needed more help. I cannot adequately describe that moment, but my colleagues and I know Shaka has been a trusted brother. You know, I always love the fact that he's actually a really down-to-earth person and uh, he loves to go to local places. You'd be surprised where you'd find him at his best. It's not the five-star restaurants, it's just a little home restaurant where the food is good, the ambience is right, and people can just interact with him without any barriers and he entertains them so freely and so casually. So that's always been a pleasure for me to, to really watch and see that, you know, big as he is, he's really, at the end of the day, just this Kabali kid who just likes to, you know, to be, to be at home wherever he is. There were many historical events that took place on the continent in the last 15 years. And as I covered some of them, Shaka and I would have conversations uh, and his ability to deconstruct some of these events while providing historical context to these moments often impressed me. His inquisitiveness, his unsparing questioning of his, uh, his guests. I appreciate when he goes, um, when he respectfully goes after uh, people and elicits good comments. Uh, he's, he has some provocative questions, but he's always respectful, treats people professionally. One thing that 
reminds me every time when I hear the name Shaka Sali is what he told me when I came to VOA. He told me, my friend, be authentic and original. Don't try to sound like someone else. If you do that, you are going to be a big disappointment to your audience. And that I took from him with a lot of uh, care. And it has helped me a lot. He told me he's 40 years in the United States. He still speaks like uh, he came from Uganda yesterday. Shaka is on point every single time you speak to him on a professional level. I mean, I've always admired the fact that, you know, I always joke with him about how he's got this instant recall. You might think you're just interacting with him socially. The next thing you know, you're learning something professionally. He's such a wealth of knowledge. I would call him uh, uh, an ultimate encyclopedia of contemporary African political philosophy. I wish that Shaka will accomplish all of his dreams, continue to mentor young people, and have a full and productive life as he retires from VOA Studios in Washington, D.C., where thousands of viewers have tuned in every Wednesday for two decades to watch Straight Talk Africa from Uganda's Kavala Kid. His story is an inspiration to many people, including myself. My wish to him uh, is to go and open a center, open a center, a foundation in his name to continue the good work. I want to wish him this whole continent, world, to be his Straight Talk Africa. I hope that you're able to apply all of the same intellect and energy that you've shown on your show to other pursuits. Godspeed. So Shaka, I'm happy to say that the African hope is very much alive. And this is not a farewell to you. This is to new beginnings, to the next phase of your journey. Well, Indugu, what is your reaction from after hearing from your colleagues? Of course, what immediately comes to mind really is for me to say how lucky I am to be viewed the way I have had by some of my colleagues. It is a very, very humbling experience. And for that, I will say I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled for their compliments and support over the years. Mm. Thank you very much, Indugu Shaka. Well, Shaka, it has been an honor working with you all these years. I can't wait to see what the next chapter in your life takes you. Well, Indugu, I wish you the very best. Thank you very much for being an inspiration to many. Thank you once again. Ndugubita, it has been equally an honor and a privilege working and knowing you for all these years. So I can honestly say, and I say this again from the deepest, bitter part of the bottom of my cavalry heart and soul, that the feeling Ndugu Peter is mutual. Thank you. You're most welcome, sir. Well, thank you, Peter, for this close look at Shaka's life and work. Stay tuned to Straight Talk Africa. After the break, we will reveal who will take on the mantle as new host of the show. So hang in right there. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. Right here on VOA. All this week on Africa 54, we are partnering with the BAL to bring you the best of African basketball. Don't miss it. Welcome back to Straight Talk Africa. This is Chaka's last show. He's retiring at the end of May. 
but this also marks a new beginning with a new host starting next week. I have the great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to Haiti Adams Fitzpatrick. In a moment, we'll have Shaka talk to her, but first, let's take a look at Haiti's career. Zoe Ludaki, the producer of Straight Talk Africa and producer Betty Ayub, put together a first person account of our work. My earliest understanding of apartheid as a child was much more about the magnitude of the resistance to apartheid, the nationwide uprisings. You know, I spent part of my childhood in Vintuk, Namibia. Uh, when we returned to South Africa in the late uh, 1980s, South Africa was burning. I was living in the townships at the time at the height of the riots, there was tension, there was chaos. I was among the first cohort of South African students who had our primary and secondary schooling under apartheid's so-called gutter education system. When I finished high school in 1994, we suddenly had access to quality tertiary education, apprenticeships, job opportunities, and we were actually being encouraged to pursue the kind of careers we never even dared dream about. And today I am a very proud beneficiary of that period of time, that investment and access to jobs. It really set us up for success in our careers, both at home in South Africa and abroad. I began my career in radio, covering really local issues in and around my home city of Cape Town. I covered crime, policing, housing shortages, problems with service delivery, local elections, labor union strikes, you name it. And I felt really comfortable covering these stories. I grew up in the townships. I was very familiar with the issues and I spoke the predominant language. But I think more importantly, I knew how to speak to people and I understood the context of their stories and of their lives because it was my context and part of my story. This is E! News Prime Time. A very good evening. We have breaking news for you tonight. As journalists, we often meet people during the worst times of their lives. And the way I was trained in African journalism is that we have this responsibility to use what we have, our microphones, our cameras, our platforms, to tell the stories of those communities that are living on the margins, who are so often ignored. And we could help make their voices heard by those in power and hold the powerful to account. Joining me from Cape Town's our correspondent, Haiti Fitzpatrick. If I think about what informs my reporting, I would say it's the variety of experiences that I've had growing up, whether it be the politics of my home country or my personal and professional experiences as a woman of colour, as a child survivor of domestic violence, as someone who has had to climb out of poverty, who was raised by a single mother who was unemployed for a long time, you know, as someone who has faced racial and gender discrimination more times than I care to count, you know, but also someone who comes from a place that is almost always portrayed through the lens of its crises and its problems, instead of what its people have overcome and accomplished in spite of what they have had to endure. So when I became the Southern Africa correspondent for European news channel France 24, I was so grateful for that opportunity because I could help change perceptions about the place that I was from. You're watching Our Voices, welcome back. Being on Our Voices was an interesting experience because this show um, allowed us to focus on women. I don't like to think of them as women's issues because, you know, if women hold up half the sky, then every issue is a woman's issue. But this was a really interesting experience for me because I was able to go back and travel to various countries on the continent in Southern Africa, East Africa, West Africa, and really hear what our audiences, especially the women, wanted to see in our programming. It confirmed to me something that I've always known and believed 
that our stories are more powerful when they feature the voices, I mean the actual voices, of people directly affected by an issue, legislation or a situation. So it's important that we remain inclusive. It speaks to that slogan for me, the one I really like, nothing about us without us. My vision for Straight Hawk Africa moving forward and what I hope to accomplish, I want to cover the society, the culture, the future, the diversity of Africa, what's now and what's next, and how Africans experience the world around them, how people interact with power, whether it be on the continent or in the diaspora. You know, Africans are living and contributing to economies all over the world. I don't think there's a single global conversation that we can have today that does not involve the continent. And my goal really is to look at the human angle, uh, the human consequence and the human impact of all these issues that we say are pressing and to look at it through the lens of good reporting so we can hear these stories firsthand from the people who are in the thick of things and on the front lines. Well, there you have it. Such an impressive journey, Aidy. We're really happy to have you on our team. Now, Shaka, how about a little chat uh, with a lady from the southern tip of Africa? I was wondering, uh, Heidi, how does it feel like uh, for the kid from Cape Town to get an opportunity to host this very interesting platform known as Straight Talk Africa throughout the continent? Shaka, I'm going to use a phrase that you always use. I'm exceedingly humbled um, by this. I, I want to start out this just um, so people can understand how interesting this dynamic is. When I started at The Voice of America, you know, I have walked into many newsrooms in my career. But when I walked in at The Voice of America, of course, I knew nobody. Um, and you were one of um, the folks who came up to me and, you know, I had known about you. I had never met you before. Um, and you came up to me and you welcomed me. You know, there's a saying that people don't remember what you say, but they remember how you make them feel. And I will never forget that you made me feel incredibly welcome. Um, at the Voice of America. Um, the reason I'm saying this today is because it stuck with me, uh, you know, and you gave me a nickname from there. You called me the kid from Cape Town. <laughs> so I must say it is such an honor to follow in the footsteps and, uh, you know, come onto the stage that was built and created from the Kabali kid to the kid from Cape Town. Um, so I am incredibly honored. Shaka, and I am grateful for everything you have done to build this platform. And I hope as we as we go forward, you know, we continue in the vein and the spirit that you have created around the show. You know, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored for your compliments and support over the years, PD. And, and I've been on your show before, and I've always enjoyed it. I've worked on the show before, but I've also be, been interviewed by you. And um, you, the way you ask questions sometimes um, can be very interesting, because when it happened to me, you, um, we were talking about women's rights, I think, at the time, and I had mentioned something about my background, and that immediately, you know, you started asking about where I am from, and because you could see the thread that where we are from informs who we are, um, how we approach our work, how we approach our, our reporting. Um, so that was a very astute observation of yours, and I'll never forget it. Shaka, uh, you know, many people have had <clears throat> obviously the privilege to ask you about um, your career, and but I haven't had that privilege yet, and I want to take advantage of this moment. I want to ask you, um, one journalist to another, one African to another, one professional to another, what do you regard as uh, the secret to why you were successful, uh, to why you were successful as a journalist, why you were successful um, on this platform as Straight Talk Africa? What do you attribute that success to? 
I, th I think that um, that is definitely a very, very important question. I think, first of all, I was fortunate enough to have had uh, what I consider to be perhaps the best quality, solid education. So that really helped and helped me along to have a very good sense of the issues that we were discussing. I also uh, happen to be lucky in the sense that uh, I'm a former paratroop lieutenant in the Ugandan army, and that meant that I had to go through training and in the process acquired an incredible sense of discipline. When I looked at uh, the role I had to play as a journalist, I had to keep three things in mind. Research, research, and research. And the other thing I had to do was uh, to feel comfortable, heady, in my skin. To feel comfortable as to who I was. And I remember one of the questions I was asked just before I hosted the first edition of Straight Talk Africa on August 2nd, 2000, was Shaka, what will it take for you to consider yourself a success as the host of Straight Talk Africa? Heidi, I remember saying spontaneously that if I could, First and foremost, succeed at remaining authentically Shakasari, the kid from Kavari, then I would have succeeded. And I'm glad to report, Heidi, that during the last 20 years on that platform, I have succeeded in remaining authentically that Kavari kid. It really makes a lot of a difference because people know exactly who they are dealing with. People know exactly, the audience knows exactly who they are interacting with. You have the authority if you are comfortable in your skin. You earn their trust. And perhaps, last but not least, the ability to be able to humble yourself as the servant of nothing but the truth. I sincerely have been guided by facts, evidence, where necessary science and data. Not by politics, not guided by innuendo, rumors, or anything. I always try to make sure that I am on top of the game by doing the necessary homework. I also developed the sense of listening more than talking. And I also always respect the newsmakers that I interact with. At the same time, I respect the audience. And I think that comes out very well. So those are some of the things, in short, really, Heidi, that have helped me to succeed as the host of Straight Talk Africa. 
Uh, Shana, this is extremely insightful, and especially as you keep talking and all these points that you mentioned, they're like bullet points that I could actually visualize, um, you know, as they happened, as I've always watched you. Uh, Shaka, surely it wasn't all a, uh, you know, a smooth ride. Uh, what did you find to be the greatest challenges over the years um, doing the show? Heidi, I had a lot of challenges over the years, especially because there were some doubting Thomases. You cannot believe that uh, I was initially given six months by some people who felt that uh, I was simply too candid, too straightforward, just like the kids who come from Kavali. There were times when I was pressured to sound like Europeans, for example, you're Americans, and I couldn't. I had situations where, when I was covering the Republic of Rwanda, I was being advised to pronounce, for example, the Rwandan capital of Chigari, as Kigali, and I couldn't. So despite the kind of problems that uh, I had to run into, the challenges I had to run into, Haiti, I focused on the forest because the trees are going to fall. And it is precisely because I focused on the forest I simply looked at the concept of the big picture while at the same time seriously doing my homework. Heidi, I never went into any show unless I had done my homework such as that. I convinced myself that I was probably more knowledgeable by the newsmakers I was going to interact with or at least on the same page in as far as the information I needed was concerned. It, it's the balance between research and, and also curiosity, I think. Um, it's That's probably... right, but especially listening. Right, right. And you know, this is something listening I hope... because the way I normally go about my journalism, really, the way I host the shows, I look at it in the context of a conversation, but a conversation that is, in fact, being journalistically filtered. Time is not our best ally, and uh, the powers that be are encouraging us to end this interaction, this interesting conversation. But I have to say this, and uh, I'm saying it from the deepest, better part of the bottom of my Kavale heart and soul, to you, the kid from Cape Town, Heidi, that you should feel comfortable and confident in your own personality, believe in yourselves, and do the necessary homework, you will definitely succeed at your next assignment. And I wish you the best of luck. And you can count on my support any time when you need it. And for that, Let me have the honor and the privilege to say, take it away, the kid from Cape Town. Shaka, thank you very much. Um, and now the kid from Cape Town is all teared up. Um, 
it, it is a great honor for me to follow in your footsteps. Um, I hope that on the show, the people who have um, found a home here, the audience who tune in every week to um, to watch you, Shaka, will continue to tune in along with you um, as we go forward. And I hope that, you know, um, we probably won't see you in the setting on the on, in studio, but we do want to keep hearing from you. We do want you to tune in, watch, be part of, of um, remain part and such an important part of what Straight Talk Africa is. I will do my best to this kid from Cape Town. Um, there are so many conversations to be had. Um, there are so many stories to be told. Uh, the thing about the show is that there's never a shortage of things to talk about. Um, but for you handing over this baton, I am truly grateful and I am truly honored. And I can say with, from the bottom of my Cape Town heart that I will do my best. I like that. And uh, I certainly look forward to be hosted by you one of these days. And for that, in the spirit of let's keep the African hope alive. Take it away, the kid from Cape Town. Thank you. Thank you, Shaka. Don't go too far. Um, whatever you will be doing in your next chapter of your life, don't go too far. We will be calling you back to the show, Shaka. I can say, I can, I can be, I can confidently tell you that uh, I intend to dedicate the rest of my life to having an opportunity to be able to motivate and inspire the African youth to be the best that they could be at whatever they choose, drawing from the experience, the, the journey, drawing from my personal and professional experience that I had gained, I've gained over the years. I have been at The Voice of America, which is about 29 years only. Now, next week is Haiti's debut on Straight Talk Africa. What are you going to talk about, Haiti? Yes, Vincent, we're going to look at what's behind the youth-led social uprisings that we've seen on the continent in recent years. And we're gonna give you an inside look into movements like Fees Must Fall, End SARS, Free Senegal, and the Sudanese Revolution. And we're also going to have special guest, Aya Chebi, the first African Union Youth Envoy. And she's going to talk to us and really give us a pan-African look at what Africa's young people really want. Next on Straight Talk Africa, we'll take an in-depth look at the youth-led social uprisings we've seen across Africa in recent years. As young people take to the streets and social media to demand change, we ask, have they been effective? And what have the mass uprisings really accomplished? Join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. Now, Sheka, we have a surprise for you. Uh, your fans from different parts of Africa reached out to you. I only wish him the best in his uh, next journey in life, wherever he's going. But I think, uh, oh, I hope that he comes back in Uganda and maybe start a journalism school or lecture in, uh, in the schools around. Maybe he can pass his knowledge to, to, to us Ugandans, to us young, young Ugandans, to us young journalism. Good luck to you, Shaka Sali. And I've been following Straight Talk Africa since I was just in my 8th grade. He has brought about a lot of development just within Africa and outside world as well. Shaka, you are the best. I, my, I'm one of your fans. I used to try never to miss the Straight Talk Africa, the way you've been... Uh, having conversation with the presidents, uh, CEOs. Ah, you're a big-headed man. You know a lot of things. You know what to ask, what to argue. Your legacy has built young African leaders and activists. You have touched 
the hearts of African leaders and some have changed and some will change in future. We're going to miss you and I know you have met at someone behind. We'll miss you. May God bless you. Shaka Shari has influenced policy and politics in Africa and we as Ugandans we are very proud of you Mr. Shaka Shari and really we wish you well in your next career or retirement. Thank you, Straight Talk Africa. Well, what an illustrious career. And uh, as uh, you know, has been mentioned, this is not the end of the journey. It's just the beginning of something else. So what is next for you, Shaq? It's very interesting that uh, you ask that important question, uh, Ndugu Vincent. You know, to be very honest with you, um, when I look at my journey, I can sincerely tell you, and I say this from the deepest, better part of the bottom of my cavalry heart and soul, that what I have had from a diversity of people, especially from the audience, and some of my you know, colleagues here at the Voice of America, humbles me so much. And I can assure you that um, along the journey, I have learned a lot. And I think uh, what I am going to have to do is to get the opportunity to put something back especially to Africa, where I was born and raised, and who, and a continent that I have had the opportunity to serve mm -hmm. via the platform of the Voice of America and Straight Talk Africa and Shaka, extra time in particular. Mm -hmm. And for that, I would like to say to you, that I would like to get an opportunity to devote the rest of my life to motivating and inspiring the African youth to be the best that they could be at whatever they choose, drawing from my journey, the lessons of my personal and professional experiences, Dugu. Yeah, great. So we can safely say you will be retired, but you will not be tired. Uh, we are still continue hearing about you. But you know, Shaka, uh, this is the big moment. I want to give you a chance now to sign off for the last time from Straight Talk Africa. And for that, I would say, get better not bitter Africa, and please, please, let's keep the African hope alive.